Good morning, church. Scripture reading today is Luke 11, 5 to 8, and 18, 1 to 7, beginning with Luke 11. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food for them to offer them. And suppose the one inside say, answers, Don't bother me, the door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Now, now reading Luke 18. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones? Who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? And um, we're picking up again this topic of prayer, and we started this last week. Really, week on week, this is a little three-week series on prayer. If, you, if, you, if you're coming in uh, fresh today and you missed last week's talk, I would encourage you to go online and have a listen on, on our website or wherever you get your podcasts from. You can even listen to the podcast on YouTube as well, um, because each, each message sort of flows into the next one. It builds on uh, what we've already been learning. Um, so please do go back and listen to that. Last week, we were looking at, as it says there, little tiny words, invitation. Um, First of all, we have to understand that prayer happens because God invites us to pray. And, and, and Jesus himself uh, gives this invitation that we were looking at last week in, in John chapter 7. Anyone who is thirsty, he says, come to me and drink. And, and, and out of him shall come, or I will give him uh, living water, by which he meant the Holy Spirit. So when, when it comes to prayer, we were looking at this last week, our attitude uh, begins very much with this invitation. So we're not trying to sort of uh, impress God or, or jazz things up. It begins because he invites us. And so um, really building on that then, we're now turning to look at approach. And so this is more focusing on us and our position, I suppose, when it comes to God. He's invited us to come and pray to him. He said, I've got blessing. I am God, your father. I love you. I'm a good God. Uh, so how do, we, how do we come to him? Um, and so that's what we're going to be looking at today. And so this is really a bit of a theme, I suppose, of, of prayer. And so for that reason, we're going to be looking at various Bible verses. I don't usually do this. Um, we usually just try and camp out in one particular text. But this time we are going to be jumping around a little bit. And some of them will come up on the screen, so don't, don't worry, don't panic. Um, first of all, then we're going to be looking together at five, what I'm calling um, facets. You know, like a diamond has different facet so you turn around and you can you can see the sun sort of glinting in it slightly differently five facets to our approach when it comes to um, prayer um, so we'll look at those in a, in a sec then then we're going to ask ourselves well that's all well and good but what if what if our prayer life is not like <laughs> these, these facets of, of, of approach uh, what do we do if that's not us and then thirdly and finally we're going to be looking at um, what what could possibly happen when we start praying like this and that's what that book, um, who did I give it to? Dirty Glory to, to, uh, to um, Leah. Um, just will stir your faith. And if, please, you know, if, of all the books, they're all excellent, but that's a brilliant one that will just uh, accompany this series so beautifully. Anyway, five facets to our approach. The first one is boldness. When we come to pray, we are to be bold in our prayers. Um, we, we've got that in Luke 11, the first of those two texts that Paul read for us. Um, we've got here this scenario that Jesus uh, creates a parable he teaches to show that we must approach God boldly when it comes to prayer. Um, the scenario is this. Um, a friend, says Jesus in chapter 11, verse 5, uh, comes to you at midnight, or, um, or goes, to, goes to a friend at midnight, um, uh, 
and appears in the middle, you know, in the middle of the night. He is a visitor from outside of town. And so, based on, I suppose, ancient Near East culture, um, whether, whether it's in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day, you are duty-bound to provide hospitality for your visitor. Um, and and uh, you must go to every length. Um, it is incredibly shameful not to be able to re- re- receive a visitor into your house, uh, come what may, day or night. Um, I, I, I discovered something of this phenomenon when I first uh, came to Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, I realized that you can't just simply have someone around for a cup of tea. I, w- I was learning this. Um, I was invited around to people's houses. And I thought I was coming for a, a, a meal based on the amount of food that was, was put out. Um, if, if someone comes to my house for a cup of tea, they'll get a cup of tea. Um, but, but apparently that's incredibly rude. You don't do that. You have to put out tea. And then you have to put out cake and six different types of scones. And then maybe some, you know, uh, some um, celebrations or something on the side. Um, and, and I realized that, 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 you, that that's one of the local customs, I suppose. And so, so put that on steroids, and that's the sort of thing that we see here in the ancient Near East that Jesus is talking about. You had, had, had to provide for your visitor no matter what time of the day or night. So this is the scenario. And, uh, and Jesus is saying, look, you've got a friend who comes to you at midnight, uh, and, and, and what are you going to do? Uh, and so... The, the individual in question has nothing in, in the house. Goodness me, I've got nothing to provide for my, my, my visitor here. And so he gets up in the middle of the night and goes round to his neighbor and knocks on his door and says to him, uh, in verse, end of verse 5, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. This is the scenario. And the neighbor says, go away. I'm not going to help you. He says, it's the middle of the night. The door is locked. My children are in bed. I'm not going to help you. But Jesus goes on to say, and yet, not because of friendship, he says um, in verse 8, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. In the middle of the night, imagine getting, getting woken up and your next door neighbor is asking for a pile of food out of your cupboards. You're likely not to, not to bother. But that's what he does. He, he asks and you can imagine here the neighbor putting on his slippers, going downstairs, getting on his dressing gown. But Jesus said, it's not because of friendship, it's because of the shameless audacity of the one who's doing the asking. Uh, he didn't care for convention. He didn't care for politeness. This was the middle of the night. He wasn't worried about waking up his neighbor. The individual asking cared so much about the thing he was asking about that he was willing to be daring. He was even willing to appear rude and break social convention And Jesus says, that is how you have to approach God in prayer. Audacious. In other words, bold. Not not, not getting caught up in saying all the right things in the right order. Starting small, you know, and and working up to the thing. Not at all. Jesus says, come with boldness. Come and present your requests. Come and present your needs. In the middle of the night, if needs be. I did this a number of times um, in my career as a hospital doctor, and particularly when, when you're, you're in trouble or someone else is in trouble and you're trying to um, help them, someone's very sick in the middle of the night, you have to phone your consultant, the boss, in the middle of the night. You're not going to ask how he is or she is or, or, or you know, have they had a good day. You cut right through all that. You say, I'm really sorry to wake you up, but this emergency is happening. I need your help right now. This is how we are to approach God in prayer. Shameless audacity. And just to be clear, God, God is not the cranky neighbor or the sleeping consultant surgeon or whatever it is in the in midnight. The point that Jesus is focusing us on here is how we are to approach him in prayer. We saw last week this invitation. We saw the open arms of Jesus. We saw uh, that he invites us to come to him, that he wants us to, to, to receive the best gift of all. The Holy Spirit will be given to those who ask, it says, in Luke chapter 11. It is his generosity and resources that we come and ask for, yet Jesus teaches we come with boldness. Shameless audacity. Don't worry about convention. Don't worry about getting your words right. Is that how you pray? Shameless audacity. The second facet then, that's the first facet. The second facet is devotion. Devotion. We're bold and we're devoted. Um, we're going to be starting in January 
uh, a teaching series through the book of Acts in the New Testament, which really tracks the progress of the early church, the good news of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the way that everything basically explodes and the good news uh, travels far and wide. It's amazing, and it will stir our faith and encourage us as a church. Um, but what we see um, when Jesus has, has died, he's risen, uh, he's spent time with his, his uh, disciples, he, he's, he's gone to the right hand of the Father, he's ascended to heaven, and they told, he told the disciples to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. So what did the disciples do as they were waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit? It tells us in Acts chapter 1, I think it's up here on the screen, verse 14, all these, all the disciples and, 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 and family members of Jesus, they were with one accord, they were together, they were devoting themselves to prayer. And some days later, when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and, and filled uh, uh, the, the, the disciples with the Holy Spirit, it says, what did they do after this? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Twice, at the beginning of the book of Acts, we see a group of people devoted to praying. They devoted themselves. This is what characterized the early church, devoted to prayer. You see, they devoted themselves. It was a, an active thing that they did. It was a decision that they made to be committed to praying. Um, the original Greek word behind our translation, uh, devote, devotion, is to be intently engaged in something. Intently engaged in something. No one had to ask them uh, to come to prayer meetings. Um, there was no prayer meeting that you would turn up and there would just be a couple of people sitting around and a lot of empty chairs. Not at all. They were devoted to prayer. And God says that that is how you are to approach me, to be devoted. It's, quite, it's natural, isn't it? When uh, you have a love for something, you are devoted to that thing. So whether for you it's a sports team, for example, if you're a follower of a particular sports team, of course you're going to go and watch your team play if you can. Or you're going to buy a, an expensive sport package so you can watch them on TV. Of course you're going to go and buy the strip and all the, all the clothing. Of course you're going to invest time and money in following your team because you are devoted to them. Likewise, um, if you love your spouse, you're devoted to them, you're going to think of ways that you can be with them and enjoy them and spend your time and your energy and your money on them. Likewise, your kids. Likewise, other things in life that you love. You have no problem devoting yourself to what you love. And if we love God then we will be devoted to him. We want to spend time with him. We want to speak with him. We want to listen to his voice. We want to enjoy him. When we pray, we are devoted. Second facet to our prayer. You with me so far? Three left. Boldness, devotion. Number three, persistence. Jesus, again, uses this parable that uh, it comes in, in, in Luke 18 on the other side of your sheet. Let's look at that together. Luke 18. We have this uh, woman who's a, a widow. It tells us at the start of the parable, Jesus told this parable to show that they should always pray and never give up. They're to be devoted. This woman, she was a widow, came to a judge who neither feared God nor cared what the people thought. She kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually attack, come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Always pray and do not give up. Do not lose heart. Never quit. Pray and persist. Keep going until there is breakthrough. That is what Jesus is teaching us here. This woman was defenseless. She was a widow, which was always bad news in the ancient Near East. She was totally powerless. She was vulnerable to attack. She obviously had some enemy or other. We're not told what that is. It's obviously a, it's a parable. It's a story. Someone trying to rip her off, take advantage of her. This is what happens in any society. So it says she kept coming to the judge. She kept asking. She kept persisting. Give me justice, she said. Because she knew that he was her only hope. The last hope. He had what she needed. Only he could provide her with justice 
against her enemy. She knew it, and so she continued until her appeals were heard, and he granted her justice. And it says eventually he relented. He granted her justice in her case out of self-interest, right? It's clear, isn't it, from here? He, He didn't do it because he fears God or cares about people. He did it so that she will stop bothering me, but she got through anyway. She was persistent. Remember, God is not the unjust judge in this story. That is not the point. Far from it. Jesus tells this parable to his disciples. What does it say at the start? So they should always pray and not give up. You're to be like the woman going to the judge, persisting. Jesus said that is how you approach God in prayer. That's why we persist in prayer. Because like the judge in this case, God has what we need. Um, God has what we truly want. And only God can provide those things for us. And like the, the, the widow in this case, we are powerless on our own. Prayer is an acknowledgement of that. I have nothing in and of myself, but I can come to the one who has everything. It's to him that I will appeal. Only God can open blind eyes. Only God can heal the sick. Only God can save us from our sins. Only God can cause our church to grow. Uh, Only God can protect us from our enemies. Only God can send his Holy Spirit to us. Only he can look after our spiritual and ultimately our material needs. No one else can do this. So we persist. Bold, devoted, persistent. The fourth facet then of our approach in prayer is that it must be faith-filled. Faith-filled. Not faithful. Yes, faithful. But faith-filled. Where do we get that from? Um, It's not on your sheet. But in Acts chapter 4, we'll be seeing this in a few months, I suppose, as we go through Acts in our new series. Um, uh, The Holy Spirit has come. Uh, The the church has been born, so to speak. The good news of Jesus um, starts expanding out to various um, tribes, uh, various nations, I suppose, in in, in seed form. Um, But it gets you into trouble. When you start talking about the kingdom of God and the good news of Jesus, it gets you into trouble. And this is what happened to uh, Peter and John, two of the apostles. They were put in prison for preaching the good news of Jesus. Um, they were eventually released from custody, hoping that that would just teach them a lesson. They were hauled in front of the Jewish high council, and they were strictly banned that if you keep preaching in the name of Jesus, worse things will happen to you. They were threatened. Almost their first instinct following their release. It says in Acts chapter 4, they went straight to the believers, that is the church, And they prayed together. It says they lifted their voices to God. Maybe your first reaction after being what you consider to be unfairly in prison will be to go straight to your solicitor and and put it down in writing. Maybe maybe that's what you should do. But their first inclination was, we've got to pray. They lifted their voices to God and they prayed faith-filled prayers. They were so captivated by God, by his his nearness, his power, that he really, really, really is with us. And his power to advance the name of his son, Jesus. And we we can read together, I think it's up on our screens here. This is the conclusion of their prayer. Acts chapter 4. Now, Lord, it says, look upon their threats. Uh, the Jewish council, and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. It goes on to say that after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. These facets are connected, obviously. They're saying in their faith-filled prayers, God, would you respond to their threats? God, would you give us power to preach your name? Would you give us boldness in the face of opposition? 
Would you help us to be faithful to you and not deny our love and our faith in Jesus? Would you work miracles, God? Would you do healings, God, that we might point to Jesus and his name? Do it, Lord. Come on, Lord. You can do this. Amen. This is how their prayers went. Full of faith. Faith-filled prayers means asking for massive breakthroughs for the sake of the kingdom of Jesus, that he might open the kingdom powerfully to more and more people. Faith-filled prayers are asking for otherworldly power and ability to stare down opposition and represent Jesus in every corner of the world. Faithful prayers, however, are more than just a vain hope, that we hope God might do these things. That's, that's okay to pray with that level. God might want to do this or that. He might want to heal or he might want to do something. But there seems to be more. A faith-filled prayer comes with a sense, an inner sense of certainty. A deep conviction, if you will, that you can ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Maybe not all the time. You may not feel this all the time. When you gather together, and pray faith-filled prayers, you can guarantee that there will be some others in the room who have faith. And do you know what happens when you enter a prayer meeting like that? Someone else's faith will stir your faith. And your faith will stir someone else's faith. And their faith will stir... So faith rises. It's like fire. It's awesome. And if you add into that, by God's grace, some prophetic words, listening to God, pray, pray with your ears open, listening to his voice, that increases our faith. So let's keep praying faith-filled prayers. We are a community on mission, after all. So let's keep praying as we, as we gather as a church, you know, through the months. Give us victory, Lord. Listen to their threats. Give us new ground in Jesus' name. These are faithful prayers. Faithful prayers. Finally, fifth facet. <coughs> Earnest. Earnestness. It's maybe a bit of an old-fashioned word these days. Earnestness. It's interesting uh, when we see um, how the church responds to trials and disasters in, in the book of Acts. And we've already seen this with Peter and John being in prison, and the, their first reaction was to go and pray. We see this again when Peter ends up back in prison. That's what happens when you start preaching the good news, by the way. You keep getting in trouble. That should not put you off. That's why you pray. Anyway, there he is in prison in Acts chapter 12. Um, uh, Peter is imprisoned. James has been killed for the faith. So things are getting worse. Oppression is increasing. Opposition is growing and it says in verse 5 of, of Acts chapter 12, I don't think, is it on your screen? There it is. Yeah, Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Earnest prayer. The Greek it, it means intense, fervent, heartfelt, gut-wrenching prayer. Involves your entire body. Weeping, emotion, tears, crying out, passion, zeal. Pleading with God. This is earnest prayer. It requires all you have, every ounce of your energy. It zaps you of that energy. It engages your whole body. Have you ever prayed like this? The apostle, um, sorry, the, the, the gospel writer, Luke, who also wrote the book of Acts, St. Luke, he only uses this word twice earnest prayer. He uses it here to describe the prayer of the church in Acts chapter 12, verse 55. But he also uses it, the only other time he uses it is in Luke 22, verse 44. What's going on there takes us back a bit in the story. Jesus 
is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's contemplating the cross. Moments before he's arrested and taken to trial and eventually crucified. Moments before Jesus is about to go through hell in order to save his people. Let me read to you. I've got one of the verses up on the screen already. It says this, this is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, Jesus withdrew about a stone's throw beyond some of his disciples. He knelt down and he prayed. This is a prayer. He said, Father, to his Father God, if you are willing, take this cup from me, cup of suffering. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Verse 44, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus prayed earnestly. Has there ever been a more earnest prayer? Praying for you, for your sin. Prayer so intense from the bottom of his heart, engaging the entire body, that he literally began to sweat blood. This is how the church is portrayed in Acts chapter 12, in earnest, fervent, gut-wrenching prayer. And it says in Acts chapter 12 that God heard their prayers, their earnest prayers. Peter miraculously was released. The gates swung open. Peter went to find other believers. Where were they? What were they doing? They were gathered together for prayer. He knew, this is the church. They're going to be in prayer. This is what we do. He went to the prayer meeting, and there they were. So let's sum up this section here. Those five facets of prayer. Scripture calls us to approach prayer persistently, boldly, with devotion, faith-filled, and earnest. The church were not going to stop praying until Peter was either dead or released. And they got the latter. Praise God. I wonder if you pray like this at all. Have you ever prayed like these things before? Have we as a church prayed like this? Well, let's ask then, we'll park those five things in our minds for a moment. Let's just ask, well, what do we do then if this does not characterize our prayer life? You as an individual, us as a church. What do we do if this is not us? Um, what if you want this to be, you know, your prayer life to be a bit more like this, but it's not? Where do you turn? Maybe you've tried to pray something like this in the past. You've tried to be persistent. You've tried to be full of faith. But it didn't work out. Your, your prayer wasn't answered in the way you wanted or with the timing that you wanted, and so you just sort of gave up. What do we do then? Well, I... I would say this, just generally, first of all, when it, when it comes to prayer and in, in our theology um, of, of prayer, we, we've got to leave room, I suppose, acknowledgement that, that God is sovereign, right? That means he's the king, he's overall, he's the creator. We are the created. Uh, the Bible says his ways are not our ways. He is higher than us in, in, in every way. He operates with complete knowledge. He sees the beginning from the end we need to keep that in mind because we, you, only see with an incredibly limited chunk of information. You only see the things from your own eyes and if my experience is anything to go by, even my own estimation of things is not always 100%. I get it wrong. We see from our own perspective. We think we know what we need when we need it but the Bible teaches us our Heavenly Father knows exactly what we need, exactly when we need it. If you're a parent, or if you're an auntie or uncle or something like that, you will understand this very well. What kids want and what they need are not the same thing. Most often. Sometimes they are, praise God, but most often they're not. And a good parent knows the power of saying no to some things. Not because you're a bad parent, you don't love your kids, but because you know what they need best for them. 
But with those things in mind, our Heavenly Father knows what we need. It doesn't always tie it to where we're at. With, even with those things in mind, these five facets that we've just been uh, thinking through this morning, they do form our approach when it comes to prayer. They do, yes, God is sovereign. Yes, he is all-wise. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. Amen. But he also calls us to pray. He invites us in. He invites us to come to him. And he gives us this sketch of how we do it. You have to be bold. You have to be faithful. You're my children. That's what he wants. Okay, so your prayer maybe in the past hasn't been answered when you wanted or how you wanted, so you gave up. Maybe you're disappointed this morning when you come uh, to church, disappointed that God hasn't come through for you. Um, it's worth acknowledging that every Christian will experience this. Every Christian will experience this at some point. Even Jesus, who prayed the most earnest prayer there has ever been, said, if it's possible, Father, take this cup of suffering from me. But not my will, but yours be done. In, the, in, the, in that scenario, I suppose we could understand it. What he hoped for and, and, and what, what, what had to be done were, were different, but ultimately he says, look, I will follow you, Lord. I'll, I'll, I'll submit to you, my Father, because you are good and I trust you. So let's restate the question then. What do we do if that's not us? Do you want to discover or rediscover this approach to prayer? How can you do it? Um, let me give you three, three little steps you can take um, on sort of reigniting or re-energizing your, your prayer life, I suppose. We'll be looking at some of these things in a bit more detail next week. Um, but but how, if you want to sort of um, approach this type, type of attitude in prayer, how can you do it? Uh, the, fir the first step you might want to take, you probably should take, number one is repent and refresh. Uh, <laughs> repent simply means turning back to Jesus. If you are walking away from him, if you're wandering away from him, if you're trying to do life on your own and you're realizing it's no good, it doesn't work, you've run out of power, run out of strength, uh, you've done wrong things against him, turn back to Jesus. Turn to him. Uh, it says, look full in his wonderful face. You know, look at Jesus. Don't look at your sin. Um, he will forgive you. He will receive you. He is, he is good. He is loving. He is kind. Repent. Turn back to him. But be refreshed by him, by his invitation. You're not, you know, do you remember the, the parable, parable of the prodigal son who wants to come home, has lived a terrible life. The father, um, you know, sees him coming a long way off. And, and the son thinks, well, look, even if I can just come and be a slave in your house, that'll do. But that's, the father won't settle for that. No, if my son or my daughter comes home, you're not going to be a slave. I'm going to restore you to the full privileges of the household. So when you repent and turn to Jesus, it's not so that you might just be a little slave in the corner of the kingdom somewhere. It's so that you might be a son or daughter with full privilege bestowed upon you. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. None of us do. But he is rich in mercy and he is kind. So be refreshed by that. Be refreshed that your prayer begins because you've been invited to pray. Take a good look at God. Behold Jesus. Listen to him. Ask for that living water and he will give it to you. Number one, repent and refresh. The second step I would encourage you, if you want to sort of reactivate your prayer life or energize it, pray in community. Pray in community. So much of what we've been learning about this morning applies to, I think primarily to the, the body, to the community, to the church. Right? Yes, you can pray on your own. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's a, Jesus was doing it. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing to do. But there is so much power available and encouragement to us when we pray as a church, when we pray as a community. Sparks will fly. We were thinking about that earlier. Prayers can sort of set off one another. You can unleash something within someone else that they weren't expecting. Faith can grow when we get together and pray. Words can be given, encouragements, prophetic uh, insights can be given and received when believers come together and pray. Spirit-led tangents can gloriously appear when we come together and pray. Pray in community. Third and final step, pray the Bible. 
if you don't know how to get going in prayer, it's a difficult thing if you're not used to it. You want to know what words can you use. If you just need to sort of uh, start saying something, pray the Bible. The Bible is God's self-disclosure of himself to you. So you can, you can pray the Bible. Use the, literally, use the words of the Bible. And that's one of the benefits of our discipleship reading, uh, sorry, discipleship project reading plan that we have up online. Um, you can go to our website or you can just Google Foundation Church Discipleship Project or something like that. I'll put it up on Facebook again. Um, but it's a daily Bible reading plan. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, where we will read as a church the same passages every day. Um, and you can use those passages in a number of ways. Um, but they can be used as the basis of your prayer. What was the psalm we had yesterday, everybody? Do you remember? Psalm 102. That was the, the reading that everyone who's doing the plan would have read um, yesterday. And let me just give you a rough idea of how you can use the Bible to pray prayers. Um, for example, it says this uh, in verse 12. You, Lord, sit in thrones forever. Your fame endures through all generations. So you can use that as a prayer. You can say, Lord God, I thank you that you are the king and you sit in throne forever, that your fame goes through all generations. And, and then you can use that to sort of develop and say, look, I, I don't feel like things are very settled in my life. I, I'm challenged. I've got these other things going on. But you are the king. You're on the throne. You can use these words to develop your own prayer life. And the more you do it, the better you'll get. One example. Of many. You can allow scripture to guide your prayers, and there are a whole bunch of other resources as well that we'll look at next week. Hope you get the idea. What if that's not us? Repent and refresh, pray in community, pray the Bible. Let's just close out though by thinking what happens if we actually start praying like this as a church? What 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 might happen? What could God do? Um I think it's important, to, uh, we, we've seen already in some of our texts this morning how, how crucial and instrumental prayer was in the early church. And we'll see this in our, in our series through Acts later on um, next year. Doors are unlocked through prayer, literally, prison doors. The gospel is advanced through prayer. People are healed through prayer. Lives are saved. If we begin to pray like this, how might that impact us as a church? And I think it's already begun. This church, Foundation Church, Belfast, was planted, started, um, on the back of prayer. We prayed and said, Lord, is this your will for us? You know, is this what you want for us to do? Uh, we sought wisdom and direction in prayer about coming to Clarewood to, um, you know, base our operations here. Um, we've been praying and we've seen prayer uh, be answered in concrete ways. We've been praying uh, about our gift day that we had during um, the summer, that, that God would, would stir a heart of generosity among our people to be able to renovate this building. And indeed, uh, we exceeded our target um, of, of giving on that special gift day. God grew our hearts for what he was doing. Um, we've been praying for people to move forward in faith, and indeed they have. We've been praying for open doors so we might, we might connect with local people in our, in our, in our, in our community, and indeed they have. Uh, we've been asking uh, for partnerships to, to begin with other churches. Um, just the other day, I was on a, on a Zoom call with a pastor from a large church in Korea. I say large. I mean, they have 60,000 members. Right? That's like the population of Bangor, you know, uh, all in one church. I don't know if that's a, a nice image or not, but uh, um, in Korea, that's, and, and they said to, he said to me, um, having never, he heard something of our vision and what we're trying to do here, and he said, do you know what? I want to let you know, we uh, at Sarang Church are all in behind you. You know, this is a partnership with, with, with a, a church in, on the other side of the world that we've been praying for. Um, Lord, give us partnerships. Help us. Um, we're going to be, uh, we've been praying for musicians, and thank, thanks, uh, guys, for, for it this morning. Um, but we've, we've recently um, uh, going to start welcoming a regular worship leader visiting from Emmanuel Church in Malau. Again, one of our friend churches and partners. And they're going to, every month, send, send a team to help us uh, lead worship, which is just tremendous. So, so, so we're already seeing answers to some of our prayers, and we're just stirring us on for more, I think. Prayer is going to be crucial for our mission and vision. Our vision is to uh, multiply gospel-centered, spirit-empowered communities on mission across Belfast, right? Uh, we're praising God, and we're loving what's happening here, and we want more. Amen. We would love to see this repeated again and again across the city. Why not pray for a dozen like this? With his help, we could do it. 
We're praying for churches to be planted across Northern Ireland and even down south as well. We're praying for 32, hoping for 32 churches across Ireland in the next 30 years through planting and strengthening churches. In order for us to see this, we must be passionately committed to prayer. Prayer is a major tool in our missional toolbox. It is a secret weapon that we must take out and use to great effect. So let me encourage you with an email that um, I've shared with one or two of you before. And this came during, um, uh, during the summer uh, from a, a woman in a church in Southlands, which is just outside Los Angeles in California. Um, how do they hear about us and know about us? It's through the advanced um, partnership that we're a part of, the, the family of churches. Uh, she's from a big uh, church out in California. Felt prompted to pray for Belfast and got in touch with her pastor who got in touch with me. I supplied some information um, just for her, her, her knowledge. And she says uh, in her email um, in response to this, she said, I've taken the last three days or so to lift up your church and you as a pastor Um, And she said, as I began praying for Foundation Church, an image came to my mind straight away. As I've prayed and asked for the Lord's guidance over these pictures, uh, over this picture, this is what I saw. And I wanted to share and believe the Lord is perhaps trying to communicate in this image. The picture I received, this is during prayer uh, for us, was of a large dam that was quite full to the brim. And the inclination I had was that the dam was about to break. Ordinarily, I can understand how this may be received as a rather ominous picture, but that wasn't how it struck me. Instead, as I prayed, the message that came to mind was that this water was about to flow out, representing a superabundance for Foundation Church, that this water would be nourishing and quenching a dry, parched landscape. I pray that Foundation Church will soon find itself overflowing with resources, ready to spill out into the community with acts of service and generosity to ultimately bring the living water to thirsty souls. It's what happens when we pray. And uh, when we pray faith-filled prayers, may it be so, Lord. And so as we close out this message, I just think I want to communicate that it's very much my sense that there is much, much more in store for us as a church. What we're seeing today, praise God, but this is really the first fruits. And I think that God, through this teaching and through emails like this and through connections with some Korean church, that God is teaching us to come and ask. Come to me and see if I won't open the floodgates of heaven and rain down so much blessing you won't know what to do with it. Could it be that as we listen to these scriptures this morning, and invest significant time and energy in prayer, that we will see increased blessing of God in our church. So as we close out, let us be bold in our praying. Let us be devoted in our praying. Let us be full of faith in our praying. Let us be persistent in our prayer. And let us be earnest. Let's pray.